Shabbat Shalom. If you're practicing observing the Sabbath, this is Torah portions here on Kingdom of Contacts. This is part of our Torah apologetic series. Thank you for joining us this morning. Um, if you're not practicing uh, celebrating the Sabbath, then um, look into it because it'll bless you. Now, the Father gave us a day of rest each week. He also gave us some uh, festivals, some holidays throughout the year uh, that are also days of rest. And it's like built in vacations into, into the creator's schedule. It's amazing. So um, if you haven't Figure that out. That's a part of your discipleship with Yeshua as your walk as a Christian. I would encourage you to look into it. It'll bless you. So I want to thank everyone that's joining me for the live chat today. We got quite a few people um, already here and excited for the to read the scriptures, which is always great. Um, I'm actually just blown away at this point in my life that I've, I, you know, found a family of of people out there, even though we're all spread out that actually enjoy digging in the scriptures like I do. I, I felt alone in that regard for most of my life. Um, and then I finally met, you know, a few people online Then I met my wife. She likes it as well. And then now, you know, we have this uh, kingdom in context thing going in our fourth year now. And looks like, you know, we found some other people that really enjoy digging in the scriptures. It's such a blessing. And it's just, um, it's what I sought for a long time. So thank you for joining me, family. It really is an honor to get to do this with you. I want to thank uh, people that are already here in the chat. Windfeather, Lion Faith and Fitness, Blossom, Mike K. Gunder, Carla Malberg, Be Good, GR Cleave, West Plays Music, Colin Crockett. Welcome, everyone. Really appreciate you. Mary Slattery. Hannibal's back. Welcome, everybody. Bill Craddock is back. Welcome. Jeremiah 1516, welcome. Let me see here. Jasmine W is here. David Shearer, welcome, welcome. Cover to cover with Jeremy Pierce is back. Welcome. The Great Deception, Maxim, Maxim Lavrov. Miss Marsh is back. Colin Crockett, Gilbert Miranda, and a whole bunch more. Can't get to all of them, guys. Um, I want to thank everybody. So the way we do these tour portions is I'm going to go over a couple chapters out of Exodus this morning. And um, it's like two and a half chapters. So after I finish a chapter, um, I'll I'll put on the screen below here. I'll show you the um, it'll look like this, right? This is the call in link. So if you actually want to call in and you just plug this this uh, URL that's scrolling across the bottom of the screen, just plug it into your new browser um, or your new window in the browser bar <clears throat> and you'll be able to join me live to talk or ask questions about what we just read from the portion, or even possibly uh, make conversation or ask a question about some of the companion passages that I've paired up with some of the main chapters. So that's up to you. Just make sure that you have, uh, just make sure that you're ready to be on camera and that uh, you're, you have, you know, your volumes turned down on your speaker so that you don't get double feedback. So you're welcome to call in when that time comes. So let's jump right into it. That way we can, uh, we've got some fun stuff to look at today here in Exodus 28 through 30. Okay, so we're looking at uh, Exodus 28 first. And this is um, Exodus 28, 1 through 5. It says, and take, you, um, and take you unto your brother Aaron. And his sons with him from among the children of Israel, that he may minister to me in a, in the priest's office. Even Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, Eliezer, and Ithamar, these are Aaron's sons. And you shall make holy garments for Aaron your brother for glory and for beauty. And you shall speak unto all that are wise hearted, whom I have filled with the spirit of wisdom, that they may make Aaron's garments to consecrate him, and that he may minister unto me in a priest's office. Uh, real quick, guys, this, this idea of, of wisdom that he's talking about here, it's not. Um, specifically the use of it in its context. It's not specifically meaning the idea of wisdom. It was just like what we've talked about in the past, which is keeping the commandments. But this one is more of a, um, a skill set, right? The, what's going on here, we're about to read them make this this uh, this robe, this ephod, and this breastplate, which is adorned with gems, which has gold work into it, which has fine crafted little chain work. So this would take a, a skilled craftsman. So that's what the wisdom is referring to in that regard. Also, I just wanted to point out here in verse one and two um, that this concept of Aaron, and his sons being being taken for the high priesthood is that they can minister to their servants to the father. And this is actually what's promised to us in our resurrection bodies 
when at the second coming of Yeshua, where we get the great resurrection of the saints, we're, we're brought into this royal priesthood with Yeshua, um, where we are ministers to the Father, which means we're going to do priestly duties to those who are um, still mortal, right? This will be the survivors of the day of the Lord, those who repopulate the earth during the millennial reign. This is why Re Revelation 20, verse 4 through 6 talks about blessed are those who take part in the first resurrection because they'll be able to rule and reign with, with Jesus Christ. So it's part of this royal priesthood we go into, and we get these holy garments at the resurrection, um, these, these white garments. I'm just going to guess they're made of, of some sort of linen, um, as Aaron's were. And uh, they'll be for glory and for beauty. So this is the beautiful promise that's being foreshadowed here with Aaron on the ground. Just like last week, we talked about all the foreshadowing of everything that they were making inside the tabernacle, even some of the furniture that represented the tabernacle and the furniture in the tabernacle in heaven above that was being um, duplicated on the earth and also a foreshadow of the thing to come. Same thing here with the sons of Aaron and his sons being made into a priesthood and the specific type of garments they receive. So it goes on in verse four and says, these garments which they make will be a breastplate, an ephod, a robe, and an embroidered coat, a miter, and a girdle. And they shall make holy garments for Aaron, your brother, and his sons, that he may minister to me in the priest's office. And they shall take gold and blue and purple and scarlet and fine linen. And you shall make the gold, the, excuse me, you shall make the ephod of gold, of blue and of purple, of scarlet, and of fine twined linen with cunning work. It shall have the two shoulder pieces thereof joined at the two edges thereof. And so it shall be joined together. And the curious girdle of the ephod, which is upon it, shall be the same according to the work thereof, even of gold, of blue and purple and scarlet and fine twined linen. And you shall take two ox onyx stones and grave on them the names of the children of Israel. Now, I'm going to stop real quick. I didn't include an extra slide here in verse 9, but if you take note of verse 9, I don't know why this is. I couldn't find a, a good reason in the context of the story or any future application, but I felt it's just worth noting that in verse nine in the Septuagint, it doesn't call these onyx stones. It calls them um, emeralds. So an onyx stone is black. And so we're talking about the, the ones that are on the shoulder pieces of the high priest would have uh, six, six names of the tribes and six on the other side. And for some reason, the Masoretic calls it a black onyx stone. And the Septuagint calls them green or emeralds, which usually is a green tint. So I'm not sure why that is, but we'll keep going. Six of the names on one stone and another six on the rest of the other stone, according to their birth, with the work of engraver in stone, like the engravings of a signet, shall you engrave the two stones with the names of the children of Israel. You shall make them to be set in ouches of gold. Guys, I know this seems like a really weird thing to highlight. I just wanted to, we're going to talk about this in some of our companion passages, Ouches of gold. This just simply means settings of gold. Okay, so we're taking these stones um, everywhere on the high priest breastplate garment and uh, and his shoulder pieces. Both the stones that are we're going to read about in the actual breastplate on the front and the ones we just read about here on the shoulders, they're set in gold. That's what the word ouches means. It's just an old Middle English word for setting. Right. This is like a jewelry. You know, your diamonds set in a little little bitty holder on top of the ring, right? So this is the idea. These stones are set in something. They're, they're held fast by a setting. Verse 12, And you shall put the two stones upon the shoulders of the ephod for stones of memorial unto the children of Israel. And Aaron shall bear their names before the Lord upon his two shoulders for a memorial, and you shall make ouches of gold. Um, I didn't highlight this. Just wanted to draw more significance real quick. Yeshua in Isaiah 53, um, 10 through 12, speaks about bearing the sins of, of us right bearing up our sins this is something that we also read about i believe it's in leviticus um 10 verse 17 about aaron was to bear the sins of the people well this is the you know there there's a there's a practical um way you would bear the sins of the people and he does that through sacrifice to going in to make this atonement meal with the father um symbolically it is him coming in as a pure person that is that is sanctified and consecrated himself to be pure to come into the tabernacle to do that and he's wearing the tribes upon him so he's like in a representative fashion since he can't literally bring one by one the millions of israelites and all their tribes one by one to the father and say hey i want to i want to represent this guy for atonement and i want to i want to ask for atonement for his sins he can't do that literally with every single person um he gets to bear them up collectively and this is why they would come and individually each of each family of the tribe would come forward and bring their uh their offering for atonement that the priest would then take 
and they would do what they were supposed to do with it. So then that th that's why there's multiple levels that we read about um, between Aaron, his sons, and then the rest of the Levites, and then how they interact with the people at large throughout the entire community. There's a hierarchy of agency happening within that system so that it all centralizes at the high priesthood and that high priesthood steps before the father to bear quote unquote, the sins of the actual people. And in a literal fashion, he's got their names on his shoulders that he has to bear the load of that because um, it, I'm sure this thing wasn't light, this breast piece and this ephod and everything. I'm sure it wasn't light. So in uh, verse 13, you shall make ouches of gold and two chains of pure gold at the ends of wreath and work. Shall you make them and fasten the wreath and chains to the ouches and you shall make the breastplate of judgment with cunning work. After the work of the ephod, shall you make it of gold, of blue, of purple and scarlet and of fine twine linen. You shall make it four square. It shall be being doubled. A span shall be the length of and a span shall be the breadth thereof. And you shall set it in settings of stone, even the four rows of stones. The first row shall be a sardius, a topaz and a carbuncle. This shall be the first row. The second row will be emerald, sapphire, and diamond. The third row is ligure and agate and amethyst. Um, the fourth row is beryl and an onyx and a jasper. They shall be set in gold in their enclosings. And the stones shall be with the names of the children of Israel, 12 according to their names, like the engravings of a signet. Every one with his name shall be according to the 12 tribes. You shall make upon the breastplate chains at the end of the wreath and work of pure gold. And you shall make upon the breastplate two rings of gold, and you shall put the two rings at the two ends of the breastplate, and you shall put the two wreathen chains of gold in the two rings, which are on the ends of the breastplate. And the other two ends of the two wreathen chains, you shall fasten in the two ouches and put them on the shoulder pieces of the ephod before it. And you shall make two rings of gold, and you shall put them on the two ends of the breastplate and the border thereof, which is in the side of the ephod inward. And the two other rings of gold you shall make, you shall make and shall put them on the two sides of the ephod underneath, toward the forepart thereof, over against the other coupling thereof, above the curious girdle of the ephod, and they shall bind the breastplate of the, of the rings thereof unto the rings of the ephod with the lace of blue, that it may be above the curious girdle of the ephod, and that the breastplate may not be loosed from the ephod. And Aaron shall bear the names of the children of Israel in the breastplate of judgment upon his heart when he goes into the holy place for the memorial before the Lord. So I think this is interesting then in verse 29 where he does talk, this is referenced, this whole setup that they're putting for this breastplate with these stones that are, that are layered in gold, um, set in gold. <clears throat> it's very interesting that it's called the breastplate of judgment. And that's, that's something that's very interesting because very often do we see later in the scriptures that the high priest who would have the ephod, which it's assumed that's a reference that he has the breastplate as well because they go hand in hand. Um, that the kings, like I, I know at one point King Saul looked for it, and also David, because they wanted to get an answer as far as whether they should go to war or not, which is a form of judgment, right? You're making a judgment call on something. And they needed, um, they wanted to ask the father, hey, you know, what's up? And so how that brought about judgment with the Urim and the Thummim, which we're going to read about here in a minute, it's very, very difficult. Uh, we've never been able to figure out exactly what that process would look like. We just know the ingredients in that process. But unfortunately, the text doesn't tell us exactly how that process happened. So we go in here in uh, verse 30. It says, you shall put into the breastplate of judgment, the Urim and the Thummim. And these were just two stones that they would put like into, imagine a hoodie where it has the little pouch, you know, where you can put your hands uh, around your stomach and the little, and the little pocket in the hoodie. That's what I see it describing as these two little pouches below the actual, the actual square gold piece with all the stones in it. You would put these two stones, the Urim and the Thummim. Um, I've never been able to find a text to tell us what happened to the Urim and the Thummim um, or the breastplate. Um, the, only, the best I can find is in the, the Apocalypse of Baruch, which would be Second Baruch, where it talks about the angels who took some of the pieces and they buried them in the ground along with the original Ark. And this would be before Nebuchadnezzar invaded the temple in approximately you know, 680 BC and took the rest of the temple utensils back to Babylon with him. So... Could the Urim and the Thummim be hidden away with the Ark of the Covenant? Could this breastplate itself be hidden away with the Ark of the Covenant because it was some sort of communication device with, with Yahweh? Um, and a communication device aside from actual angels showing up and giving a, a message. So it's very interesting to see how this works. Um, it's very interesting. So I'd love to, can't wait to, you know, the sun returns and, and we uh, will we'll get to get a fun explanation of some of this stuff because we'll get to see him use it. That's the amazing part. Um, 
And you should, verse 31, you shall make the robe of the ephod all blue, and there shall be a hole in the top of it in the midst thereof. It shall be a binding of woven work round about the whole of it, as it were the whole of a, of a habergeon, that it not be rent. And beneath upon the hem of it, you shall make pomegranates of blue and of purple and scarlet round about the hem, and bells of gold between them round about. A golden bell and a pomegranate, a golden bell and a pomegranate upon the hem of the robe round about. And it tells us what these, these bells are for. Okay, so this is upon Aaron's garment. He wants to put bells on him. And it shall be upon Aaron to minister, and his sound, that's the sound from the bells, as he's walking, shall be heard when he goes into the holy place before the Lord, and when he comes out, that he not die. And he shall make a plate of pure gold, engraven upon it like the engravings of a signet, holiness to the Lord. Now, real quick, in case you've never heard this, this idea, um, the most common understanding of why there's bells on him that he can be heard when he goes into the holy place before the Lord and it, it adds on there that he not die. Um, what most people think is it's not saying that he had that he had to have the bells on. So, um, I mean, yes, the bells are instructed as a part of this. But most people think it's that if they heard the bells not ringing, then he's dead. And they would just, um, they would have to get him out. <laughs> so, because, you know, he would go in there to minister. And there, guys... In this moment here in this tabernacle, there's an angel in there. there. This is the angel of the presence that's just chilling. When all these places where it says go into Aaron would go into minister unto me, well, Yahweh Himself, the actual Almighty Creator, is not just chilling in this little tent. There's an actual angel of the presence. This is what we read about next. We're, we're going to read about Exodus 33, the one that actually descends and Yah and Moses speaks face to face with the Elohim. And this is the representate the representate excuse me the agent of representation that uh, Yahweh sent with the Israelites, and he explains this in Exodus twenty three. This is the job of angels; they're a higher form of priesthood, as Hebrews one fourteen explains to us. And they minister unto those who are inheriting salvation, which Moses and the Israelites would, would fall into that category. So this is why the Father would send His angel, the angel of the presence. And I'm I'm sorry for all those who who have vehemently. Uh, latched on to the idea that it's Yeshua. It's not a pre-incarnate Yeshua, guys. Yeshua, that would be the angel of the presence is ministering in a priestly capacity at this point and at this moment. Yeshua was not given his priesthood until he came in the flesh, died, and resurrected. And upon his resurrection, he's given his priesthood. That's what Hebrews explains to us, not before. So to place a pre-incarnate Yeshua into the role of the angel of the presence here in in the Exodus story, um, you're you're ignoring all the book of Hebrews trying to explain when Yeshua gets his appointment, which was what was prophesied of him. So, you know, we've done shows on this, we've talked about this a lot, but hopefully that's a quick, good, quick reminder for you. Um, so basically, this is why you know some people believe that he's got if he didn't purify himself properly according to some of the instructions that we read about later in Leviticus, then Aaron would go in, he would go unclean both in his heart and in his body, if he did that and went into the actual Holy of Holies to minister before the Lord, he could possibly die. So he would have these bells on. If they heard the bell stop moving, they assume that, well, he he's dead. And so they would have to get him out. Uh, verse 36 talks about him making this plate of pure gold engraved upon it, as engraving of a signet holiness to the Lord. That's a beautiful thing because we actually see a similarity with that in Zechariah chapter 14, 15 through 20, talking about all the, uh, the cooking utensils. Um, or have this engraving this on them in the millennial reign, which I think is a, a beautiful thing, um, as well as the bells. So there'll be, yeah, it's interesting. Verse 37, you shall put it on a blue lace and that it may be up on the miter, up on the forefront of the miter it shall be. By the way, guys, this this miter, this is an, um, a King James word. This is an old school word that's just referring to um, the idea of the little crown that would go on the front of the turban uh, for Aaron's headdress, Okay. And that, that's what they would refer to as the mitre. And it shall be upon Aaron's forehead that he may bear the iniquity of the holy things which the children of Israel shall hallow and all their holy gifts. And it shall always be upon his forehead that they may be accepted before the Lord. And you shall embroider the coat of fine linen and you shall make, excuse me, the mitre of fine linen and you shall make the girdle, make the girdle of needlework. So um, again, some translations will actually have the word turban. So it's like the whole headdress piece, the, the turban with this gold plate on front Generically, I'll refer to as a miter. Um, the gold plate, obviously, some people would refer to it like as a crown. Um, that's the way I've always seen it. And in fact, I think that's the way it's referenced in Leviticus chapter 8 in his actual ordination. Um, he actually gets crowned 
And so I think that that's interesting. Well, also I think we read about it in Exodus 26 as well. So um, several different concepts, the same concept described in several different manners um, is basically what I'm seeing here. Verse 40, for the sons of Aaron, you shall make coats and you shall make them for girdles and bonnets. You shall make them for, for glory and for beauty. You should put them upon them an apron, Aaron upon apron, excuse me. And you shall put them upon Aaron, your brother and his sons with him. You shall anoint them and consecrate them and sanctify them that they may minister unto me in the priest's office. And you shall make them linen breeches to cover their nakedness for the loins, even to the thighs they shall reach. And they shall be upon Aaron and his sons when they come into the tabernacle of congregation. And when they come near to the altar to minister in the holy place, that they may not bear iniquity and die. It shall be a statute forever unto him and his seed after him. So I had a, a real quick, I had a, um, I found a really beautiful picture that someone had put on Pinterest, actually, just of the stones of the breastplate with the engraving inside. And this is, we read about this multiple times, right? That these stones would have the engraving of an engraver's work. So what does that phrase mean? Well, this is what most people think it means, right? When you would actually engrave something into a stone and you would engrave the actual names of the different tribes into the 12 different stones on the breastplate the high priest would wear because he goes in to represent all the 12 tribes. It's pretty beautiful, especially if they were highly polished gemstones. It'd be really beautiful. <clears throat> so this is another artist representation, both of the linen ephod, the blue piece, um, the actual the back piece with all their the chains and the the wreath like and adornments on the chains, as well as the gold settings which the stones would sit in on top of the um, on the embroidered work of uh, you know blue and purple and scarlet and and fine linen. So this was, and of course he's got the the headdress in his hand with the um, holiness to the Lord there in the front and the gold plate. Um, so this would be like his whole little ensemble, if you will, that he's supposed to wear as he goes to minister on behalf of the sons of Israel before Yahweh. And we don't know if the stones that are set into those settings are, or are highly polished or not. This is just an artist representation. I wouldn't put it past it to, to be highly polished and some, you know, everything they're doing is a highly uh, sophisticated craftsman artwork. So this is not a, this is not for newbies, guys. This means that the, the children of Israel that came out of Egypt had learned these skills and these crafts over time inside of their oppression in Egypt. So they weren't just sitting around like, they, you know, I, I know that the common idea is that they were just slave laborers that were just making mud bricks all the time and building walls. And yes, they were doing that too. But apparently some of them were doing other things and learning like highly um, coveted craftsmanship like this type of uh, jewelry work. So same thing for all the people that build the furniture in the tabernacle. And, the, and I mean, that's engineering and architecture. So they had some knowledge. They really did. Um, Revelation 21, little companion passage. Guys, at this time, if you if you have a question about what we just read, um, if you wanted to call in at any to ask any questions or commentary about what we just read or about what we're about to read in these companion passages, now's your time. It's scrolling at the bottom of the screen. Um, it's also in the chat. I'll put it in again real quick that you guys can call in if you'd like. All right, so Revelation 21, verse 15. says, He talked with me, and he that talked with me had a golden reed to measure the city and the gates thereof and the wall thereof. And the city lies four square, and the length is as large as the breadth. And he measured the city with a reed, 12,000 furlongs. The length and the breadth and the height of it are equal. So I think it's fascinating to me that it's a four square city. This is exactly the, the shape of the breastplate. It was four square that we saw, we just read about on the high priest Aaron. Verse 17, he measured the wall there of 140 and four cubits, according to the measure of a man that is of the angel. And the building of the wall of it was of jasper and the city was pure gold, like in the clear glass. So this is beautiful. I, I'm going to show you some pictures here in a minute of the different types of jasper. That's beautiful, guys. It's going to, it's, <laughs> we'll go over that in just a second. Verse 19, he says, the foundations of the wall of the city were garnished with all manner of precious stones. Well, that's amazing. He's going to actually explain the different types of precious stones uh, that are mentioned here. And many of them, if not all of them, are very similar to what we just read about in the uh, in the breastplate. Now, between the he the ancient Hebrew and the Greek, um, there are some differences. I'm going to show here in a minute in Isaiah 54 how the Greek Septuagint actually has some of the same wording for some of these descriptions, specifically of the Jasper, when it references the construction materials of the New Jerusalem. Um but I think that there's no coincidence here that the, the priest himself, who is a represent, representative of the entire uh, 
makeup of the occupation of those who inhabit the New Jerusalem. A royal priesthood lives in that city. And that the high priest would wear something of gold that has all these precious stones in it, the same, the same shape with the same amount of stones in it, just like you were about to read here. It's pretty interesting. Uh, verse 19, the foundations of all the city were garnished with all manner of precious stones. The first foundation was Jasper, the second Sapphire, the third Chalcedony, the fourth and Emerald. Real quick, guys, I just, for any of you that that study rocks, I mean, my wife is a rock hound. She loves rocks. Um, Jasper is actually a form of Chalcedony. Same thing with agate. So you'll, you'll see some of these words that you're like, wait a minute, if you know these things, you're like, wait a minute, aren't they the same? There's just so many different types of Chalcedony. Chalcedony is even a form of a quartz. Um, so Jasper and agate, they're, they're very similar. Um, so it's just, it's, it's interesting to me why the translators would have chosen different types or, or words that may be of the same family of rock, but they just have slightly different variations. But it's interesting. So the first foundation was Jasper, the second Sapphire, the third Chalcedony, the fourth and Emerald. The fifth was Sardonyx. The sixth was Sardius. The seventh was Chrysolite. The eighth was Beryl. Beryl is beautiful, guys. It's truly beautiful. The ninth is Topaz, and the tenth was Chrysoprasus, and the eleventh was Jacinth, and the twelfth was Amethyst. The twelve gates were twelve pearls. Every several gate was of one pearl, and the street of the city was pure gold, as it were transparent glass. So that would be ridiculously highly refined gold to, to actually be to the point of transparency. But it's not impossible. In fact, I'm pretty sure it was MIT just this past year announced that they had figured out how to refine, um, I think it was aluminum, to where it looks like glass, but it's actually aluminum. Um, Put in the chat if you heard that news report and, and I got that wrong. I'm pretty sure it was aluminum that it's actually they figured out how to make it to where it's just clear. Um, so anyway, beautiful description of the city. Let's look at some of these uh, some of these things here. Also being described in Isaiah 54. Guys, remember, it's the same message. It's 100 percent the same message. So this is in the Septuagint from 10 to 13, Isaiah 54. It says, shall the mountains depart, nor shall your hills be removed. So. Neither shall my mercy fail you, nor shall the covenant of my peace, of your peace, be at all removed. Real quick, guys, I just want to uh, throw this out there. He's speaking directly to the New Jerusalem. I know a lot of people. <laughs> there, there's a comment. There's a there's a huge debate, and I, I I'm sad that there is a debate. I don't think there should be a debate because it's the words are pretty clear in the scripture. Um, but there's a big debate, but people conflating the ideas of the body of believers with the actual inheritance of the believers, which is the New Jerusalem. and the Old Testament, the inheritance of the believers, which this same chapter references in Isaiah 54, 17, is the New Jerusalem. It's the, it's, the, it's what Revelation 21, 1 through 7 explains, is the inheritance for the saints. This is this massive city that's been promised. This is what Hebrews 11, 10 through 14 references. Abraham looked for a city whose architect and builder was God. It is Zion. It is the New, Te the, the New Jerusalem in the New Testament. So in the Old Testament, it's referenced as Zion. So that's the entire context of Isaiah 54. We're getting a history of Zion, a history and a future promises to this place that is the inheritance of the saints. Yahweh is not speaking to the saints. Yahweh is speaking to the city who he speaks to and gives her kind of a female personification at times. That's why she's called the bride in Revelation 21, 9 and 10. So here in verse 10, he's talking, he says, He's speaking rhetorically because, you know, Yahweh is always speaking rhetorically because he's he's saying this bad things will not happen to you, but these good things will happen to you. I will ensure it. So in verse 10, he says, shall the mountains depart, nor shall your, heel, your heels be removed. So neither shall my mercy fail you, nor shall the covenant of your peace be at all removed. So he's basically saying, I will continue my covenant of peace with you for the Lord who is gracious to you is spoken of it. Afflicted and outcast, you who has not been comforted. When has the, the Zion, the New Jerusalem, been afflicted and outcast? Well, guys, if you've seen our Kingdom Cast episode, it's called Kingdom of the Garden. I explained this, whereas the New Jerusalem we see in Revelation 21 that we just read the descriptions of used to be the Garden of Eden. So Adam and Eve were cast out of it. She was then left alone. She was, and all the animals, according to Jubilees chapter 3, were also cast out of it as well. She was then left barren and without children. She's going to receive an entire nation in a day, Isaiah 66, 7, in the future at the great resurrection. 
and she's going to be suddenly full of children. So this is why, you know, the, the father, the, the, there's a character in scripture, which is the, the bride. It's the, it's the new Jerusalem that's been there the whole time. It's the garden. It was a character introduced in Genesis chapter two, along with the, the place that Adam and Eve were put into. Um, and second Ezra chapter six explains to us that it was, no, I'm sorry. Jubilees chapter three and four explains it was created on day three. Um, and it was, so it was created actually before mankind was created. So this is a, a character in the scriptures of being referred to in this moment here and Yahweh's promising comfort to her and promising good things are going to happen. Verse 11 says, um, you were afflicted and outcast and you have not been comforted, but behold, I will prepare a carbuncle for your stones and sapphire for your foundations. So we just read in Revelation 21 and I will make your buttresses of Jasper. That's what we just read in Revelation 21, your gates of crystal and your border of precious stones. Wow. That's amazing guys. Um, and verse 13 says, and I will cause all your sons to be taught of God and your children to be in great peace. This is, this is amazing. And a lot of people say, well, for those of you who have been actively listening, I should say, you may be asking the question right now, wait a minute. It's promising that her sons will be taught of God. What we Sean, you said her sons are those who are in the resurrection. They inherit her. Those are her sons and daughters that are referenced in Isaiah 49. So why I thought at the, at the great resurrection that we'll have all of his laws written on our heart and we want to teach each other about God because we'll be glorified with his, all of his laws in our heart and we'll be living in, in the city. So who, who's she teaching about God? Well, and that's the beautiful part, guys. This is where Zechariah chapter 11, verse 2, excuse me, chapter 2, verse 11, and is the reference of Isaiah 57, 19, as well as what Paul tries to explain in Romans 15, is that this is when the Gentiles will hope in Yeshua. This is after the day of the Lord, after the second coming where he routes out the wicked. He takes the ten kings out of the equation so there's no more oppression upon the earth. The new Jerusalem has descended. The resurrected saints are living inside the city. Outside the city are mortals who were not resurrected yet. They did not take part in the first resurrection. They just lived through the calamity of the day of the Lord as survivors. These are the survivors referenced in Isaiah 66, verses 17 to 21, also in Zechariah 14, verses 14 through 20, where that they're drawn from all over the earth and they're brought to Yeshua for the sheep and goats judgment. Those who are still alive after that judgment, who are called sheep, they are then grafted into Israel. They become a part of Israel. They step into the moniker of sainthood because they become like a saint, right? And even though the word sainthood is kind of a weird term, we don't use it a lot, um, it's the idea is being a saint, right? Is someone that is striving towards righteousness who is in covenant, right? That someone's been grafted in. So you can be a saint both after the resurrection and before the resurrection because you become into the family of God, into the commonwealth of Israel, into the seed of promise. You step into that, that grafted into the vine. This is what's going to happen with all the sheep after the Matthew 25 sheep and goats judgment. Those sheep then repopulate the rest of the earth. And as Isaiah 2, 2 through 5 explains, they, that, those, that group of sheep, are then taught the law of God. They're also part of the children of the city of Zion, just like the resurrected saints are part of the children of the city of Zion on the inside. Because why? Because the entire family of Israel is all the children of Zion. That's, do you see how that works, guys? So inside the city, the resurrected, mortal, glorified, immortal saints, also the believers who are also called saints, who are still mortal, who live outside the city, who are learning the ways of God still. They're all part of the family of God. They're all the children of Zion. So yes, this is when all the nations will hope in Yeshua. This is just also like 1 Enoch 46 talks about, 7 through 10. All the nations will come together, and the goats, they're weeded out. The sheep, they remain, and they get to be taught the Torah, the, sac the stuff that we're learning today. In fact, they're going to see it in action, where we're just learning about it and trying to imagine what it looks like. They'll get to see it actually in action. So it's going to be a beautiful, beautiful time. So that's that's the idea of, of you know, trying to help you understand a little bit better about the, the correlation here that we're reading in this tour portion with Exodus 28 of why it's such a big deal that the father would ask mankind to start practicing this role of the high priesthood on the earth in the exact replica of what's going on in heaven with the exact clothing. This is this is like a huge stage play. And specifically, you have to have all the exact requirements of, 
you know, the, the, the cleanness of what would be happening in heaven with the ministers, the priesthood of the angels bringing forth um, through their priesthood, bringing forth the holy gifts to the Father in the heavenly tabernacle above. Because remember, guys, Yeshua is not a high priest in heaven until he is a given that position at the appointed time. I can't stress this strong enough. This There is a huge movement out there. People claiming that Yeshua is just doing everything and all the positions and all the jobs, and that's not what the word says. There's there's definitions for words that are used in the scriptures, and Yeshua does his part when his part is at the appointed time to do it. There's no other character in scripture where we just say, Oh, well, he was he was doing that, even though it was prophesied of him to happen at a certain time, he was doing, you know, what I'm saying we don't we don't do that. Before, you know, <laughs> David was was uh you know anointed to be king but he wasn't king yet until he was actually made king there was many years that passed between he was prophesied over him that he would become king versus actually stepping into the actual role of ruling so we don't we don't sit there and just say well oh well david was already king we know he wasn't already king yet so it it just blows my mind right just like in the it's this and a lot of it comes from Catholic terminology. I, I got to let you guys know, because it's taken this um, this new covenant idea, the description of the new covenant, trying to apply it to our our lives as believers now, when it doesn't technically apply. So this is why you a lot of people would say, "Oh, well, you're in the kingdom now," and you're like, "Really? Where's where's all these gates of sapphire and crystal and carbonk and onyx and and, and crystal phase and where where's all this stuff? Where's that kingdom? Show me show me that kingdom." You're in the kingdom now. The kingdom has a the river of life flowing out from beneath the throne of Yeshua and the trees of life growing on the sides of the river. Come show me that. Take me to it. If you're in the kingdom now, if we're in the kingdom now, where's Yeshua? Yeshua comes with the kingdom. Where is he? If we're in the kingdom now. See, all this, all this language, this conflation of terms. People do the same thing when they try to say, well, Yeshua was running around doing these priestly duties in the wilderness, in the tabernacle with Moses and Aaron. But the, specifically, the word tells us that was an angel. We also have all these other scriptures tell us that angels are part of a priesthood. And they've been in their own priesthood since the very beginning. So it breaks my heart um, to hear that type of conflation because it confuses people outside of the context of scripture to the point where they run around saying, I'm a, I'm a holy priest for the father of Yahweh right now. And I'm like, really show me the temple you're ministering holy gifts in. Can you even explain to me the process of how you would create a, a burnt offering? Cause it's, there's a very specific process. Do you even know the purification and consecration requirements for a, a priest to be doing that, to be to what you're calling yourself? When's the last time you've actually consecrated yourself according to Leviticus? The, none of them will answer any of that stuff because they'll say, oh, well, that was, you know, all this mixed theology in there. Just So uh, this is why, you know, we we stress these things. We, we try to stress the context. I've just been giving you a ton of context to the priesthood, its relevance to what's going on um, both in heaven and what's coming for the future with the kingdom of heaven that actually descends down to the earth and interacts with the earth plane. Hopefully it's uh, it's beneficial help for you as you engage and and encounter some of these conversations with other believers who've heard a lot of ideas, but haven't heard a lot of context to these ideas. So if we keep going here, this is what Jasper looks like. This is actually a wide variety of Jasper. This is just some of the variety of how beautiful Jasper can be. And even though some of these pieces look like they're an actual painting on a rock, this is not guys. It's an actual natural formation of colors within the rock. It is tremendously beautiful. This is another piece of Jasper. Look how beautiful this is, guys. It says the foundations, the walls are made of Jasper. Just one of the beautiful stones mentioned in both Isaiah and Revelation. Look how beautiful this is. Just get a glimpse of and try to try to think and just ima- use your imagination of how beautiful your your heavenly inheritance will be. 1,500 miles tall, made out of something as beautiful as this stuff. Look at the different colors just all mixed together. I don't know which color he's going to use. I just know there's a ton of choices for him to use. It could be all these colors put together in beautiful mosaic patterns. Who knows? Who knows? <laughs> Wouldn't it be amazing if the entirety of, of 
the the uh, the artwork across the you know the 1500 square mile city the huge walls that people could see for 200 miles away much further even you you know and they're just looking at this beautiful tapestry of these stones that are intricately layered together uh, with this huge mural that tells the story of creation salvation redemption for all the mortals just in case they forget, just in case they need a reminder, they just look to the city and they could see. I mean, I'm just throwing that out there, just just an idea. I don't know if that's what it's going to be. I'm just saying I wouldn't put it past the, the father to have his angels construct the city with uh, this multicolored Jasper to make a beautiful mural that tells a story. I, I just I wouldn't put it past him. It'd be amazing. Look how beautiful this is. Now, I also wouldn't put it past the father to use this color Jasper for the walls because it reminds me of Zizi. You have the white with the with the layer of blue. Who knows? Is that why we wear ZZ to remind us of the of the kingdom? We also know it's for the commandments, yes, but right, you can't get into the kingdom unless you're doing the commandments. So they're hand in hand. The commandments are the kingdom behavior, guys. When you, so those of you who wear ZZ and you look down and you say, you know, this is a reminder of doing the commandments, it's a reminder of doing the behavior of the kingdom of God. This would be if if this blue uh, blue sediment type of jasper was part of the walls of the New Jerusalem, that would be just gorgeous, truly gorgeous. So jasper can even come in clear clear colors, as if it were transparent. How beautiful would that be, with with little you know depths of color built in, as you see on the right hand side with this um, highly polished. Uh, little ball they made of Jasper. Also, I just wanted to share with you what the ancient cultures used to believe about Jasper, which is pretty interesting. Okay, guys. So this is now many of these ancient cultures were not following Yahweh. Some of them were, but still they all had very high regard for this particular stone. And it's interesting that this stone is, is used to describe the, the construction of the new Jerusalem. They, so it's, it's found multicolored, it's banded or spotted. It's commonly found in reds and browns, like I've been showing you, but there, there is blue Jasper and there's green Jasper. Um, it has long been used as tools for hardness and spears and axes. Okay. A lot of stones were in the past. That's not uncommon. But ancient cultures just believe that Jasper helped cure liver and intestinal ailments, as well as stomach and gynecological ailments, and also cleanse the body of toxins. So that's interesting. I don't know how they think it does that, um, but that's what they believed about Jasper, how it was a special stone. The stone was once believed to cure insanity with God's help and heal demon-possessed people. That's interesting, because that means the people that are using that stone do believe in God and are trying to practically somehow use the stone to affect positive change. I, I, I don't understand how that works, but that's interesting. Uh, the Egyptians, they placed amulets on the deceased as Jasper was believed to create a safe passage in death. Just the Egyptians held a high regard of Jasper as well. Um, a lot of cultures believe that it was protective, that it had calming effects, it offers stability, and it balances the emotional and the intellectual. So if the father's going to build an entire city with this as a huge part of the construction pieces of the walls of the city uh, and the foundation itself, sounds like a great, you know, whatever uh, electromagnetic energy and frequency that this thing is putting off, sounds like a great opportunity to, to create the peace that we just read about in Isaiah 54, where he promises peace, a covenant of peace with the city and the, the inhabitants of the city. And even those outside the city who come to the city for Sabbaths and new moons, they'll also have peace. It's literally the, the prince of peace lives inside a city of peace made of a stone that's believed to help facilitate peace. It's amazing. It's crazy. Um, it's also known as the great rain bearer in the fourth century. I'm not sure exactly what they mean by that. It also has the origins of the name Jasper in Greek is Eopsis, which is what it is. If you look it up in Revelation 21 of the Greek, and then it, and they also believed to bring happiness, uh, aids in sleep and then protective properties. Um, there was another, <clears throat> another thing I read, I didn't include it in here, but it, this was like more of people that are kind of like new age. They love Jasper as well. And they believe that it, I thought it was very interesting. Okay. They believed also these things that it brought healing, it had protective properties, but they also believed that it was the stone that brought justice to unjust situations. And I thought, man, that's, that is wild that they would believe that about the stone. Right. And I don't know how they come to that conclusion. All I do know is that the scriptures tell us the new Jerusalem is made of Jasper and 
in addition to other things, obviously, but this is one of the one of the things that's mentioned as both the walls and the foundation is made of jasper. And when the New Jerusalem descends and sets on the earth, it brings a city of justice to the entire plane of the earth, routes out the, you know, the, the, the angels and the king of the city that come with it, establish peace on the earth and bring justice to an unjust situation. And I thought, man, that's that is fascinating. Uh, so, yeah, clearly there's long, long held history um, that this stone has been really important uh, for a lot of people in a lot of cultures. So if we also go on here, uh, I want to show you guys this real quick. Give me one second. And um, just give me one second. Let me pull this up. I wanted to share this quick little video with us because it's remember what I told you before earlier that um, Chalcedony and Jasper, they're they're kind of in the same family, but they're also in the, the bigger, larger family of courts. They're a different type of courts. And there's different forms of, of Jasper that I saw where people can actually um, create the, these stones of, of Jasper actually hold electrical energy inside them. And so I'm going to show you something, a little example of that. Let me give me one second here. If I can find it, I had it queued up, but then I just lost it. There it is. Okay. Give me one second and... Okay, we may not need the sound, but hopefully you guys can see this. So this is a, um, a piece of quartz, okay? So even though this is a little more easier to see because of the, of the lighting, I just wanted to show you guys real quick. I actually have with me, because I told you earlier that my, my wife is a huge rock hound. So we actually go digging for rocks. We've actually been to multiple places where we found agate and jasper, different types of chalcedony. And I have some with me, actually. It's hard to see. But I actually have some with me. This is a form of agate. It's in the family of Jasper. It's found with Jasper. Many times it's connected directly inside of Jasper as a part of the Jasper. So I think it's fascinating uh, because it, it can be highly polished to where it's almost see-through. It's beautiful. Here is uh, red Jasper. It's, it's highly polished because she actually tumbled this one already. It looks, just looks amazing. It's hard to really see it, but truly amazing. And this is another form as well that's uh more milky and white very beautiful i don't know if you can really it's not focusing on from the camera but um but then also there there's people online that are that are figuring out with these different types of chalcedony uh, which again is the family of jasper and agate as well as quartz that there's all these different types but they're also in the same structural family as far as their internal molecular structure okay as, as what type of rock they actually are so here are some some actual pure uh, quartz crystals. So the same family of chalcedony and jasper, just very di little bit different, being in the in uh, in a, a type of pure quartz. Okay. So there's there's videos online, like I'm about to show you here, of people taking um, jasper and chalcedony stones, and they're just like popping them together, and you can see electrical sparks produced. I wanted to try it here because I can actually do it with these two stones. I've done it before. I just can't do it. Um, with my lighting set up and everything, I have to turn everything off and I've got a, I've got kind of, it'd be a hassle. So I was just going to show you this video of someone that's actually doing that. There is electrical power stored inside these rocks. Well, that puts off frequency. Everything in life puts off frequency. So let me show you what this looks like. So what this guy's going to do is he actually is going to take this drill bit and he's going to drill down inside of this quartz crystal and, he's, and the friction inside of it that from the drill bit is going to create electrical spark inside of it. And there's actually, this is called piezoelectricity. A lot of people are trying to figure out a way to harness the electrical energy that's, that's inside these rocks because literally it'd be like harnessing power just from the ground, right? So let me go to, it's kind of an annoying sound because you can hear them actually creating the friction inside the crystal. And as you can see, that's electrical current that you're seeing lighting up the crystal. Like how beautiful that is, guys. So 
So of course he puts too much pressure and he actually breaks it. But the the whole point is that those crystals, that power that's being harnessed, it is always there. It's it's been in there. It comes through the ground, absorbed into these minerals of these of these stones. Now imagine an entire city built like that. Will we be able to see a highly polished, and by the way, gold is a huge conductor of electricity. It's one of the best conductors of electricity. Everything we read in the breastplate, as well as the descriptions, the same shape of the breastplate with the stones, the same things we read, the same shape in the stones of the description of the city of our inheritance, the, the kingdom, is a huge uh, conductor of electricity. So this is what we've talked about in the past that the, you know, the, the firmament that we talked about last week, the seven layered firmament, which as Psalm 50, Psalm 150 verse one references as the firmament of power. It's electrical power flowing through all of creation. Imagine a city built highly purified stones, beautiful in color, highly purified gold to the point of transparency. Oh, by the way, remember it has the, the high, the, Breastplate of the high priest had all the settings, the ouches of gold around all the gemstones. Well, to me, that's just like, oh, that's that's cool. That's just the streets of the city. But that's, you know, representative, right? That's an interpretive. But to me, that's what I would see is the all the little settings of gold around it. Yes, it's practical, but it also would represent all the, the beautiful streets of gold of the city that around this a beautiful, beautiful city made of all these precious stones that are highly purified many to the point of possible transparency and what happens when the spirit of God moves, which the whole city is made of the spirit of God from my understanding, which is why it's called the spirit and the bride in Revelation 22 and Isaiah 54, excuse me, Isaiah 55. I wouldn't be surprised to see power running through it. Just like we saw in that quartz crystal when a little bit of pressure was applied. It's just a, just a beautiful thought that I have about the, the kingdom of God specifically because you have the firmament, which it's made of the same materials, in my understanding, this crystalline substance, which is what quartz is, flowing with power, being a, a, a conductor of the power. That's why in Revelation chapter 27 through 10, at the end of the millennial reign, when Satan's let loose and deceives people and they try to come and attack the beloved city, which is the New Jerusalem, and it says fire comes down from the firmament from, from heaven, which the word heaven is the word firmament. Fire comes down and destroys it, right? It destroys the attackers. That's a that's a beautiful that would make perfect sense, right? If you have all this power already surging through the walls of the city, and the walls of the city are literally connected to the refashioned firmament, as Revelation 21 explains. It just let a little bit of that off and destroy your attackers. This is actually what's promised to the city in Isaiah 54, 13, uh, or 14 through 15, where it talks about if anyone tries to attack you, um, you'll be able to defend yourself. So it's a it's a beautiful promise to the bride. Hope to encourage that with you guys, um, because that to me is just like the father has thought this all through and no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind can understand how beautiful this thing that's been prepared for us is that is going to be coming down through the sky with what, what Psalms refers to as the glory of God is when in reference to the city, just this massively beautiful thing coming down that will cause the enemy to to flee in terror because not only will they be realizing there would have been a big room and that uh, heliocentricity and all that evolutionary model is bunk, but while they're going through that red pill moment, they'll also see this amazing army coming and in this massive, beautiful city falling down behind them. So yeah, it's for the enemy who doesn't, who is uh, against all that, they're going to be very afraid for the believer who's anticipating all that knowing that peace is being brought to the earth, it's a moment of joy. All right, no one called in right now, so we're going to go ahead and we'll go to, uh, to, to 29. Psalm 29, 1-5. through 5. This is the thing that you shall do unto them to hollow them. That's Aaron and his sons. To minister to me in the priest's office, take one young bullock, 
two rams without blemish, and unleavened bread and cakes, unleavened temper with oil, and wafers unleavened anointed with oil of wheat and flour shall you make them. And you shall put them into one basket, and bring them in the basket with the bullock and two rams. And Aaron and his sons you shall bring to the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, and you shall wash them with water. You shall take them, and you shall take the garments and put upon Aaron the coat and the robe of the ephod, and the ephod and the breastplate, and the gird with him, the curious girdle of the ephod. You should put the mitre upon his head and put the holy crown upon the mitre. Then you should take the anointing oil and pour it upon his head and anoint him. And you shall bring his sons and put coats upon them. And you shall gird them with girdles, Aaron and his sons, and put the bonnets on them. And the priest's office shall be theirs for a perpetual statute. You shall consecrate Aaron and his sons. And you shall cause a, a bullock to be brought before the tabernacle of the congregation. And Aaron and his sons shall put their hands upon the head of the bullock. And you shall kill the bullock before the Lord by the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And you shall take of the blood of the bullock and put it upon the horns of the altar with your finger and pour all the blood beside the bottom of the altar. And you shall take all the fat that covers the inwards and the cow that is above the liver and the two kidneys and the fat that's upon them and burn them upon the altar. But the flesh of the bullock and its skin and its dung you sh shall you burn with fire outside the camp. It's a sin offering. That you shall... Uh, that shall also take one, excuse me, you shall also take one ram and Aaron and his sons shall put their hands upon the head of the ram and you shall slay the ram and you shall take his blood and sprinkle it upon the altar and you shall cut the ram in pieces and wash the inwards of him and his legs and put them into pieces and upon, unto his head and you shall burn the whole ram upon the altar. It is a burnt offering to the Lord. It's a sweet savor, an offering made by fire to the Lord. You should take the other ram, and Aaron and his sons shall put their hands upon the head of the ram. Then you shall kill the ram and take of his blood and put it upon the tip of the right ear of Aaron, upon the tip of the right ear of his sons, and upon the thumb of their right hand, upon the great toe of their right foot, and sprinkle the blood upon the altar round about. And you shall take of the blood of that is upon the altar and of the anointing oil and sprinkle it upon Aaron and upon his garments and upon his sons and upon the garments of his sons with him, and they, he shall be hallowed, and his garments and his sons and his sons' sons' garments with him. Also you shall take the ram of the fat and the rump and the fat that covers the inwards and the cowl above the liver and the two kidneys and the fat that's upon them and the right shoulder, for it is the ram of consecration. And one loaf of bread and one cake of oiled bread and one wafer out of the basket of the unleavened bread that is before the Lord. You shall put all in the hands of Aaron and in the hands of his sons and shall wave them for a wave offering before the Lord. And you shall receive them of their hands and and burn them upon the altar for an off burnt offering for a sweet savor before the Lord. It's an acceptable offering made by fire to the Lord. This is Aaron and his sons are making a meal with Yahweh. And in this verses here, 23 to 25, they're giving Yahweh his part of the meal. Does that make sense, guys? So not just part of the animals, but also part of the, the, the bread that's being made. Um, so I just, I hope, you know, and the, the basket of the unleavened bread, hopefully that's, that's understandable, right? It's verse 26. You should take the breast of the ram of Aaron's consecration and wave it for a wave offering before the Lord, and it shall be your part. So I, it seems like a small insignificant phrase, but I just want to remind people, because this is a huge point of contention among believers, because they don't, most of them don't know the Old Testament. When it says to take this wave offering, which it just described as the, as the breast of a ram, and it shall be your part, that means Aaron and his sons, they would get to eat of this particular part. So the previous verses, they're making a meal, and they gave part of that meal. They made a plate for Yahweh, and they gave it to Yahweh. It's called a burnt offering. Now they're making a plate for themselves. So this is what this is talking about. You're going to fill Aaron's hands with food. What's he going to do with it? He's going to disperse it like a servant would. This is why they're called servants to ministers to Yahweh. He's going to give in his service. He's going to give some to the to the king to Yahweh, and then he's going to keep some for himself because he's about to have a meal, a fellowship meal with the Father. That's all this is, guys. Yes, there's a specific way they're supposed to cook it with certain seasonings, with certain you know. But this ultimately, and yes, even this particular context is a consecration for the ordination of the priesthood. But all these fellowship offerings, all of these, these atonement sin and thanksgiving and guilt offerings, all these different types of offerings that are done, first fruit offerings, they're all just meals that are made. This is not out of the ordinary for anything. I, I, I want to take two seconds just to, to review this for anyone watching, guys. The sacrifices in the Old Testament were not unnecessary. Every day in life, people make meals to eat. That's all they're doing. They're making a meal with the Father. It's not unnecessary. It's not some weird ritual. It's literally just them 
properly cutting and trimming an animal to create meals with it, as well as the wine, the bread, the, the you know, sometimes the corn, sometimes the oil, you know, depends on what the sacrifice is asked for. We have been trained poorly by modern Christianity that the word sacrifice is a bad thing. And the, and the Satan loves it. Satan loves the fact that people think believers think that sacrifices is somehow a bad thing. It's literally a synonym word for making a meal with the father, for having a barbecue with the father, making you a plate. That's all it is. It's not a scary thing. And that's all we're reading about right here. It's not a big deal. Verse 27, you shall sanctify the breast of the wave offering and the shoulder of the heave offering, which is waved and which is heaved upon of the ram of the consecration, even of that which is for Aaron and of that which is for his sons. It shall be for Aaron and his sons by a statute forever from the children of Israel, for it's a heave offering. It shall be a heave offering for the children of Israel of the sacrifice of their peace offerings, even their heave offerings unto the Lord. And the holy garments of Aaron shall be his sons after him to anoint therein and to be, and to be consecrated in them. And that son that is priest in his stead shall put them on seven days. And when he comes into the tabernacle of the congregation to minister in the holy place, you shall take the ram of the consecration and see this flesh in the holy place. And Aaron and his sons shall eat the flesh of the ram and the bread that's in the basket by the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And you shall eat those things wherewith the atonement was made to consecrate and to sanctify them. But a stranger shall not eat thereof because they are holy or set apart. Again, I just highlighted this to kind of reference the idea that Aaron and his sons are not just throwing this stuff away for no reason. They're not just, there's this animal did not die needlessly. Okay. This is literally a part of what the father created was, was some animals for eating, some are for not. This goes all the way back to the very beginning. These animals that are used in this particular sacrifice are for eating. And you see in verse 33, Aaron can eat them. <laughs> it's that simple. It's very simple. It's just, he's just making a meal, just like everyone does every day, of the, every day of our lives. <laughs> Verse 34, and if out of the flesh of the consecrations or of the bread remain until the morning, then you shall burn the remainder with fire if it's not be eaten, because it's set apart. And you shall do unto Aaron and his sons according to all the things that I commanded you. Seven days shall you consecrate them. And you shall offer every day a bullock for a sin offering for atonement, and you shall cleanse the altar when you have made an atonement for it, and you shall anoint it and to sanctify it. Seven days shall you make an atonement for the altar and to sanctify it, and it shall be an altar most set apart, most holy. Whoever touches the altar shall be holy. Verse 38. Now this is what you shall offer upon the altar. Two lambs of the first year, day by day, continually. One lamb shall you offer in the morning, and the other lamb you shall offer at evening. With the one lamb, a tenth deal of flour mingled with the fourth part of a hen of beaten oil and a fourth part of a hen of wine for drink offering. To all of you guys out there that like to cook, men or women, you watch cooking shows and they tell you the ingredients for what they're about to cook, that's all we're reading about right here. They're making a meal and they're just telling you the ingredients, which that that's the only thing different is that in your your normal everyday life, you take it upon yourself to choose to cook different things on different days. Well, the father is saying, look, I want this. I want certain meals made in a certain way on certain times of the day and then on certain days. He just has requirements for how it's made and when it's made, but it's still just a meal being made. That's all it is. Verse 40, and then with the one lamb, a tenth deal of flour mingled with the fourth part of a hen of beaten oil and the fourth part of a hen of wine for a drink offering. And the other lamb you shall offer at evening and you shall do thereto according to the meat offering of the morning and according to the drink offering thereof for a sweet savor and offering made by fire to the Lord. This shall be a continual burnt offering throughout your generations at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation before the Lord, where I will meet with you to speak to you. And there I and, and there I will meet with the children of Israel and the tabernacle shall be sanctified by my glory. Did Yahweh literally show up in this in these moments in verse 43? Every morning and every evening when they did these sacrifices, did Yahweh literally himself show up and look at Aaron and say, thanks for this food? No, there is an angel that is their agency in the representation of Yahweh there to say, you did this right. Good. It's a considered a sweet, acceptable burnt offering to the Father. And that angel of the presence, which is literally what he's called, which is Jubilees 2, 2 tells us the angels of the presence were created on day one of creation. They're a part of the father's priesthood. That's the one that's there. And this tabernacle moment watching Aaron do this 
and approving that he's doing it right. What happens when it doesn't get done right? <laughs> it's pretty serious, right? So this is why I said it's it's all very serious, but they're also just doing a practice, a stage play for what's taking place in heaven. But it's still very serious because as we read Leviticus 9, two of Aaron's sons don't do it right. They do it disrespectfully and they get they, they pay a, a big price for that. So here in verse 44, and I will sanctify the tabernacle of the congregation and the altar. I will sanctify also both Aaron and his sons to minister to me in the priest's office. And I will dwell among the children of Israel and I will be their God. Did Yahweh literally dwell among them in that moment? No, it's the angel of his presence, his representative dwelled among them. To the, to the Israelites, it's the same thing because they know how it worked. They knew. And Moses is reminded and a few chapters later. We'll see it next week. Yahweh tells him, I cannot be around you and you live. No flesh can see me and live. This is why we have to have glorified resurrected bodies like Yeshua received in order to, to go stand next to the Father. These bodies like the angels have, like they get to stand next to the Father and minister to him. Mortal, we can't. This is why since the beginning, since Adam and Eve in the garden, we've always dealt with angels as the representatives, as the intermediaries, as the go-between. Jubilees tells us the angels taught Adam how to do things in the garden, how to tend it, how to be to do husbandry over the garden. Adam never saw Yahweh. Just gonna, you know, burst your bubble there, guys. Sorry to sorry to, to burst your bubble today. He never saw Yahweh. I mean, doesn't Yeshua tell us? Like in the flesh. Now, a vision is a different thing, right? If you see a vision of heaven, you see angels, you see God. You see Daniel saw that in Daniel 7. I think it was uh, thir you know, 10 through 13, 10 through 14, right? Enoch sees that, uh, First Enoch 46, 48, a whole bunch of different places, right? Ezekiel sees that, Ezekiel 1, Ezekiel 8, Ezekiel 10, a whole bunch of different places. Ezekiel 43. But you don't literally, in the flesh, with your physical eyes, physical body, outside of a spiritual vision, Mortal man cannot see Yahweh and live. This is why he's always had to use his angels in order to uh, be the intermediary between us. And that's what we're seeing happen. All this verbiage, all this terminology that we're reading about in the days of the Exodus, all the way up to the days of, of the physical standing temple of Solomon that was built, that went up to the days of Yeshua. If there was any form of the presence of God in that temple, it was done through the angel as a conduit. It was not literally the Father. Just want to make that super clear to everybody. Okay, guys, if, um, if you have any questions about what we just re just reviewed in chapter 29, now's the time. You can use the link scrolling at the bottom of the screen. Uh, you can actually call in and speak with me live or ask a question. I'm also going to put this in the chat right now, again, so that you guys can uh, use that. Be ready to be on camera live, um, and we can have a fun discussion, or I can try to address your question. And... Uh, Um, looks like we have a question in the chat real quick. Uh, Jeremiah 15, 16 is asking two questions. Okay. When Paul says the Jews will be brought to jealousy, is this during the millennial reign? Uh, no, personally, I think that this is during the time that we've been in for the last 2000 years. Um, is that, you know, we see the, the, the engrafting happening all over the place at a huge rate, uh, amongst quote unquote, the nations, the Gentiles that it's currently happening presently before our, our eyes. Um, I don't know. Uh, I'd have to go back and, and look at the full context of, of the passage. But to my understanding from what I read from that in the past, he's not talking about the millennial reign because at that point, everyone who have will be receiving the resurrected body from now to the point you sure returns will receive it. Um, anyone that makes it through the sheep and goat judgments is now called sheep and they're grafted in already. So they don't have anything to be jealous of. So there's no more goats on the earth. There's no after once the millennial rain starts, there's no one that's an unbeliever. Just letting you guys know how that works. They'll still have the choice to believe. That's why they're chosen as sheep, because they have the propensity. They've already shown the behavior of the kingdom in their life. Uh, that that Paul talks about in Romans 2 is what they're exhibiting this in their conscience, um, which is this inherent understanding in their conscience that they what's right and what's wrong. Uh, those are the ones chosen as sheep. And this is all the goats are weeded out. So there, there's no one that would be jealous of anything at that time. And I, I honestly, sister, I don't know about the, the Wakanda and the Black Panther part. Um, it's, it's an interesting theory. I, I have no clue about the writers of that, about what, why they did some of those things.
Percy Lundquist, um, in, what was it? Is Genesis 30? The the actual word in the Hebrew is Penuel, which is an actual name of an angel, as uh, Enoch re- reveals to us. And that and the, the translation of that word means face of the Lord. So this is very interesting that Jacob would say, oh, I saw Penuel. Also, the book of Jubilees says that Jacob had the writings of Enoch. So why would he say that specific name? The translators see that and they go, oh, it means face of the Lord. And he wrestled with Elohim. So he must have seen God. It comes from a translator bias. This is why you would, like I've said before, the same translator that thinks that Jacob literally wrestled with God also translated Exodus 33 where it says no flesh could see him and live, yet they think Jacob hung on to God and lived for an entire night. No, that's that would be a, con- a massive contradiction. Literally, angels are everywhere in the Old Testament helping people. These are the angels that Jacob interacted with. And there's literally an angel named Penuel, which means the face of God. So just a translator translator assumption that creates a little bit of confusion. All right, guys. Before we read Leviticus 8, our companion passage, um, we're going to look. uh, We got a caller coming in, Clifton Breedlove. Before we read Leviticus 8. Hey, bro. Um, Hello. To... Brother. Um, <laughs> I'm not okay. seeing your face. There you go. There you go. Oh. Turn, turn down your volume so we don't get the feedback. All right. I can hear myself talking. It's going to it's gonna give some wicked feedback here in a minute. There you go. Turn down your volume so we don't get the feedback. Sorry. There we go. It's okay, brother. How you doing today? Thanks for calling in. Pretty good, pretty good. I uh, I had a question. I put it in the in the chat. I don't know if maybe you already answered it, or if you had a video, maybe you could refer me to. What's your question? Uh, hold on. I uh, hold on just a sec. Yeah, I'm it, sorry, brother. I don't see all the questions in the chat. It goes too fast, and I'm, I'm yeah, multitasking. Yeah. Uh, you probably can't see me, but I got to read it. Um, my question is, why does the ephod have different stones and orders of the stones throughout scriptures? For example, uh, Exodus 28, uh, 17 through 20, uh, Exodus 39, 10 through 13, Ezekiel 28, 13, and, Re- and Revelation 21, 19, specifically to like the order of the stones and... Okay. Well, the tribes, the 10, 12, the 12 tribes of Israel. Now, the, the, the reference in Revelation 21, 19, that's not the breastplate it's referring to. That's the foundation stones of the New Jerusalem. So that would be, uh, I, I'm going to address the breastplate question like you're asking, but the I okay. personally wouldn't be including that. I was trying to make the comparison as far as the shape of the breastplate, the type of stones that are used. And I also was trying to reference earlier where I said there are some differences between the Greek and the Masoretic as far as the translation of words. And it also will depend on the translation you're using because you can you can look at a 15th century KJV translation of some of these words, and it'll use words like carbuncle, um, but then you might look at a modern translation and it'll just say ruby. Mm. All right. So this is why I was mentioning earlier about if you're not a rock nerd like my wife is, and you don't have a lot of exposure to um, the different families of rocks, if you will, and, and the different different names that are given to the same rock over time. So a lot of people don't realize this. And, and like, for example, there's a translation, the NASB uh, in Isaiah 54 that refers to um, instead of calling it Jasper, I believe it calls it um, um, believes it calls it uh, fiery stones. And then another modern, newer translation of the NASB actually just calls it Ruby. Well, hmm. a Jasper, I got it in my hand, puts off a highly polished red shine in the light like a fiery stone. And it also right. has the color of ruby. So it just depends on the translator. Now, as far as the specific question, as far as, uh, the, you know, chapter 28, chapter 30, and chapter, uh, or excuse me, chapter 39 and, and 28, um, I would have to do a side-by-side comparison. I apologize. I haven't done specifically that. to that's see. Right. Yeah, but that's what I would say. That would be my first suggestion as far as trying to, to investigate what you're reading as differences. Make sure you have... Um, the Greek Septuagint next to you with whatever translation you're using. Because remember that the, the modern translations that we have in English, they get updated often because right. the publishers that make those Bibles want to sell more Bibles. So that means they've got to come out with a slightly different version 
uh, even of their own translation that could be copyrighted. They'll come out 25 years later with a slightly different version so they can add new commentary and new little inserts and new little subtitles and change the color scheme and, you know what I'm saying, and try to put in a little bit more modern English where it's easier for people to read. And then suddenly they come out with the new KJV, right? Right, right. So they'll put in slightly different words and sometimes thinking the average person won't even catch that they may even switch words occasionally. That's why I mentioned earlier, and this is and this is a great question you're asking because it can confuse a lot of people. Jasper and Agate, they're literally in the same family of stones. There's a version of Jasper and Agate that is the same stone, but then they're also Agate's independent and then Jasper's independent. So that can be very confusing for a translator if he doesn't have enough familiarity with rocks and all, right. all the different types of rocks. So in one translation, he could see from the Greek agate and use the word agate. And then th nine chapters later, he could use the word Jasper. And it looks like it's talking about two different stones or that the stones have been reorganized. You see what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, mean, I, mainly, like I mainly asked because uh, all throughout scripture, I think it's Isaiah or Ezekiel. I, I don't remember exactly where it was, but I did read that they went to the river Jordan to pick out 12 stones to represent the 12 tribes. Mm -hmm. So I was thinking, well, it must be the only those type of stones that you'd find in the Jordan river. And I thought there's, there has to be something major here that's just been hidden from us over time. Yeah. We're I think just you're, missing. <laughs> uh, possibly referring to Joshua chapter six. Um, yes. That's but, Joshua. Yeah. But it, I can tell you as someone that has literally stood in, in mountain, creeks and mountain rivers and picked out smooth stones at the bottom because those are beautiful stones that you can pick out of out of uh, mountain rivers I, I live in the colorado rockies and my wife yes. and i literally do what what we read in joshua six yes I'm, some, I'm from colorado as well i know what you're, oh, sweet. What you mean. yeah you know what i'm talking about so <laughs> yeah yeah i'm not sure specifically the significance of whether the jordan river has all these types of stones in it i if it has emerald in it and, and Sapphire, that would be pretty amazing. Um, hmm. That would, seems like that would be um, somewhat, someone already figured that out by now. So I'm not sure exactly the correlation there, but that's a good thought, brother. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Thanks, man. Thanks for calling in. Shabbat shalom. All right. Shabbat shalom to you. All right. So I'm going to uh, go ahead and pull up Leviticus 8. You guys are welcome to call in if you need to at this time. And we'll run through some of Leviticus 8 real quick as a companion to what we just read. In Exodus 29, it says, verse 33, You shall not go out of the door of the tabernacle of the congregation in seven days, until the days of your consecration be at an end. For seven days shall, be, shall he consecrate you. This is Aaron and his sons actually going through the consecration that we just read about being described and instructed in Exodus 29. In verse 34, he says, And as he has done this day, so the Lord has commanded to do, make an atonement for you. Therefore shall you abide at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation day and night, seven days, and keep the charge of the Lord that you die not, for so I command it. Now, the reason I wanted to kind of point this out, uh, this specific part, is a, it's a big chapter. Go ahead and read the whole chapter of Leviticus 8. But this specific three or four verses of the actual ordination of Aaron and his sons is before they can actually minister, they go through this process. Seven days, standing at the door of the tabernacle in this ordination process, after they've had, you know, the, the things slaughtered for them and the, the blood put on their earlobe and their thumb and their toe and all this stuff. Very interesting. They're being cleansed. Okay. Now the cleansing process with the Rams and the blood, I don't think is going to apply because of what Hebrews nine and 10 explains about Yeshua's resurrected body. And he doesn't need that type of cleansing before he ministered because he's been given this perfected body that is not, is it doesn't need this type of cleansing, but the process of going through an, an official ordination period of seven days, I think all the, all the resurrected saints who are going to be brought into the royal priesthood are going to go through the same process. This is why I believe from the moment Yeshua returns with the angels to fight the battle of Armageddon to the moment the new Jerusalem finishes descending and sits down upon the earth will be a period of seven days. Because the resurrected saints will be brought into it. They'll start their ordination process. And then they'll actually be full on part of the royal priesthood after that seven day process. Once the city sits down on the ground, all the battles have been done and, and dealt with. The angels have cleared out the land and purified it for the city to sit down. Then we have the marriage supper of the lamb at that point. So 
yeah, that's where I think that's that's the time that's where I get that timeline. If you ever heard me mention this in the past, it's literally based upon the promise of the covenant to us as saints, but with where we're going, the timing of, all, of it all, and everything. And so I, I think that there's just about a seven day time period where the inhabitants of the earth will see the new Jerusalem descending for about seven days. We'll already be inside the new Jerusalem, as Isaiah 26, 19 through 21 explains. We've been resurrected and taken to our rooms to avoid the wrath that's happening on the earth for the Battle of Armageddon um, and everything else happening with Yeshua and the warrior angels coming down to destroy the wicked and round up the, the Antichrist and the dragon and the false prophet. And we're we're hidden away safely going through our, our priestly ordination at that time. That's just my understanding of all this. So if we go on to 1 Peter chapter 2, that we get, you know, the Apostle Peter reminding us that we are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. That means a set apart nation, a peculiar people that you should show forth the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous lights. We're promised to be given to be illumined with God's lights. Revelation 22, 3, Revelation 22, 5, I should say, um, at the resurrection. That's the proleptic reference that Peter has given us in this moment. That we are called out of darkness into his marvelous light. Yes, we're called out of the darkness of our bad behavior, which our wicked behavior, our anti-Torah behavior is called darkness. Our Torah behavior is called light. Okay, so we're called into that behavior as a part of our discipleship. But we actually get this marvelous light given to us once we become a part of this royal priesthood, this set-apart nation. We're not there yet. That happens at the resurrection. But this is the prolepsis that we can speak about confidently because we know that the son will faithfully carry through with the promises to us. Verse 10, which in times past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Abide at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation day and night, seven days, and keep the charge of the Lord that you die not. For, oh, I'm sorry, guys. There's a typo here. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I don't know how it mixed the two together. One second. It mixed the two verses together. Fix that real quick. You guys get to see the live mistakes. It's great. So anyway, I just hope to encourage you guys with that. This is what I was talking about earlier. People, people want to say that they're already in this priesthood. Where's your temple? There's no temple you're ministering in right now, guys. The, the, the only temple that's prophesied to you in this priesthood is the New Jerusalem, and that's not here yet. I promise you, 1,500 square miles, 1,500 miles tall, you're not going to miss it when it's here. It didn't show up in 8070. I promise you. When it does show up, it's never leaving. It's not here. It's not, you know, <laughs> Yeshua is not here yet. This just blows my mind, this, this mentality. These people think they're already in something that's promised only when Yeshua returns. It's like, we've got to keep things in context. This is our responsibility. Exodus chapter 30. Uh, guys, if y'all want to go ahead and call in, um, just go. I'm going to read these next 10 verses real quick, but um, and I'll put the, the thing back up on the screen for you to call in. Exodus 30, 1 through 5, and you shall make an altar to burn incense upon. Of shittim wood shall you make it. A cubit shall be the length thereof, and a cubit the breadth thereof. Four square shall it be, and two cubits shall be the height thereof. The horns thereof shall be of the same, and you shall overlay it with pure gold, the top thereof, and the sides thereof round about, and the horns thereof. And you shall make unto it a crown of gold round about, and two golden rings shall you make it to under the crown of it, by the two corners thereof, upon the two sides of it shall you make it, and they shall be for places for the staves to bear it withal. And you shall make the staves of shittim wood and overlay them with gold. Verse 6 through 10 says, And you shall put it before the veil that is by the ark of the testimony, before the mercy seat that is over the testimony, where I will meet with you. Where who will meet with us? Yahweh will meet with us. Why and how? In the form of his angel, the presence in this moment that they're reading about here in Exodus 30. Yahweh himself does not literally, it's literally, he does it through the agency of the angel of the presence that he sent to go before them and be with them, pillar of cloud by day, fire by night. Verse 7, And Aaron shall burn thereupon sweet incense every morning. When he dresses the lamps, he shall burn incense upon it. And when Aaron lights the lamps at evening, he shall burn incense upon it at perpetual incense before the Lord throughout your generations. You shall offer no strange incense thereupon, nor burnt sacrifice, nor meat offering, neither shall you pour drink offering thereupon. And Aaron shall make an atonement upon the horns of it once a year with the blood of the sin offering of the atonements. Once in the year shall ye make atonement upon it throughout your generations. It is most holy to the Lord. Okay. So we've got, we'll finish the rest of chapter 30 next week. 
we just watched uh, some instructions about them morning and evening, burning this incense and in, uh, on this um, this altar right next to the Holy of Holies. Jubilees chapter 3, 26 and 27. And he made for them, and that's Yahweh through his angels. And Yahweh made for them coats of skin and clothed them and sent them forth from the Garden of Eden. Talking about Adam and Eve. And on that day on which Adam went forth from the garden, he offered as a sweet savor an offering. Frankincense and galbanum and stacti and spices in the morning with the rising of the sun from the day when he covered his shame. So not only is he offering a, a, an offering of incense, but he's doing it also in the morning. And it's the day when he covered his shame, which is exactly what we read about those breaches earlier that was instructed for the high priest to be warned when they start doing this stuff, their priestly duties. Yahweh covered them appropriately. He covered Adam appropriately. And then Adam's doing priestly duties. How appropriate? Because Adam was a high priest when he got out of the garden because he had to minister over his family unto Yahweh. He bared the sins of his family who were under his authority. And he did that as an intermediary to Yahweh. Adam was the first priest among mortal men on the earth. Do you guys see how that works? This is why I've said before in the past, I've said that Genesis chapter 5 is not just pointless genealogy. It's literally showing you the men who were chosen out of those family lines to be a part of the priesthood. This is why when we follow that family lineage of the people that are actually mentioned, because not all the kids are mentioned, but of the kids that are mentioned in that, in that generational secession, and it gets to the point of Noah, Noah's a high priest. Noah's a priest and a high priest. This is, this is why it's focusing on those specific peoples. This is why Eve would say, Seth, I've been appointed another seed by the Father, by Yahweh, to raise up since Cain killed Abel. So, anyway, uh, that's a whole separate teaching. That's a whole other thing. I just want to point that out real quick, just to show you that the language is already there. If you know the Torah, you can go through books like Jubilees and Enoch, and you see priesthood language, and you see Torah language everywhere, guys. This is, you know, Torah portions. It's part of our Torah apologetic series. I'm just kind of sharing, when we know the Torah, we can read Second Peter nine and ten and understand hundred percent. Oh, oh, that's right. It's yeah. That's I'm not a priest right now because a priest specifically has duties that I can't do right now, but I can when the kingdom comes. Okay, I get it. See what I'm saying? So when you know the Torah, before the Torah, after the Torah, whatever you want to call, whatever time frame you look at with Scripture, you'll know Scripture better. You want to understand Paul's words better? Get to know the Torah. This is, this is, you know, it's that easy. It's literally that easy. All, all the descriptions, the definitions, the words, the context is provided for us in the scriptures. Um, so it, I, hopefully that's an encouragement to you guys. And let me see here. I think I have one more. Nope. That was it. So if anyone wants to call in, if you have any questions about anything we covered, um, you're welcome to either use the link that's scrolling below and call in, or you can put them in all capitalization in the chat. I'll take a couple of questions uh, before we end the broadcast today. Uh, Mark Allen is asking, Sean, as fathers and husbands, are we still to act in a priestly way? Well, I would say, it, you know, yes, it, as, a, as a single man, behave like the priests. Why? Because they will be the, the leaders of example of behavior. Now, again, how are we defining the term priestly way? if it's not just literally someone that's faithful and doing the instructions of God for living, which is his commandments, because that was the, the first and foremost requirement for the priesthood. All the other requirements that we just read about how they interact with sacrifices and the, and the altars and the holy of holies, all that stuff. That's, brother, that's not for you and I. We, that's the specific context of Aaron's specific lineage and specifically appointed to him. And he went through an ordination process. Um, so unless you know that you're literally a descendant of Aaron down through the line of Zadok at some point, but even then prophecy tells you, you have no temple to minister in until the new Jerusalem gets here. So you see what I'm saying? We have to keep these things in context. We have to, in the context of what the father described pertaining to these positions, these roles, these duties, but as a father and a husband, hundred percent, you want to act in a, if, if you're using the word priestly in the sense of, 
the example you're doing, the behavior you're doing, then yes, 100%, because the priests were supposed to be someone that was faithful in doing the Torah and that were speaking the words of God faithfully and responsibly. Um, so, yeah, 100%, I'd encourage that. That's just that's just good discipleship. So, great question, brother. All right, Be Good is asking, which believers will repopulate the earth in the millennium? Only the survivors. Only the survivors who are called sheep in the Matthew 25 sheep and goats judgment. Where the goats are killed in judgment, the sheep, they're, they're spared, they remain, and because they exhibited the behavior of Torah in their life, and that's they have the propensity for kingdom behavior, they're going to be taught the rest of the Torah as they repopulate the earth outside the New Jerusalem during the millennial reign. So yeah, those are mortals. All the resurrected immortals are the saints of who took part in the first resurrection. They're going to live inside the city. So yes. Oh, thanks, Matt L. I appreciate you, brother. Uh, Tony, as asking if Abraham was part of the Melchizedek priesthood, why did he tithe to Melchizedek the man? Because that's what all the priests would do. So just like. Uh, you know, it's it's actually a part of the priestly description in Malachi chapter, the whole book of Malachi is the father reprimanding the priests the, uh, specifically for not doing their jobs and refraining. You guys remember that famous passage in Mike, Malachi 3.10 where the father's talking about, you know, if, if um, let's go to it real quick. The priests themselves were supposed to tithe. They're supposed to keep the law, so they get they got first fruits tithes, uh, as well as tithes. I, I should say I, I, I mix the words. I apologize. They got first fruit offerings as well as an actual tithe. So let's look here at Malachi three ten. I'll put this on screen for us. All right. So here in Malachi three ten. It says, bring your tithes in the storehouse that there may be meat in my house and prove me now herewith, says the Lord of hosts. I will not, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there shall not be enough room to receive it. So during the days of Malachi, the priesthood itself, the sons of Levi were rebellious, just as it was prophesied back in the Testament of Levi, way back in the day. And they were rebellious. They were not doing the instructions of the Torah, even to the point of not tithing themselves. As we read in Leviticus, the priesthood, Aaron and his sons were also supposed to give of the tithe that they received from the people that was their portion. They were then supposed to tithe a, a percentage of that as well. So this is why Abraham can be a part of a priesthood, but still give honor to someone who's in a priesthood over him, which would have been the Melchizedek, the, the, the priest of the Most High God, the high priest at that time. So it's, it's just a part of the actual breakdown of hierarchy, like I mentioned earlier, of, of the Torah for priesthoods. Hopefully that's a decent answer for you, brother. All right, looks like we have a caller calling in right now. Let's let's bring him here. Uh, Christian, hey, brother. Welcome. Shabbat hey, shalom. Shabbat shalom. Um, I just had a quick question about, because I've been kind of wondering about this for a while, and maybe you have a video out, out there. Um, you know, I found you almost a year ago, so I'm still catching up. But... Um, the survivors, so, you know, when this millennial reign starts, you know, all the people who obey Torah and abide in, you know, Yah and Yeshua, you know, they become priests when it comes down. Um, with the, the survivors, these survivors who survive, you know, the day of the Lord and, that, you know, everything that happens and they repopulate and they live outside the city. Do they, do they eventually get resurrected? Like, do they ever, do they ever get heavenly bodies or is it just, is it going to be, um, yeah people living, you know, living in, um, are they going to just live that way forever and obey? Or are they eventually going to be a part like in the, do you know what I mean? In the city, or are they going to be mortal forever? I do. Yeah. You're, that's why we have the second resurrection. Okay. Is it, you wouldn't want to call it the first resurrection if it was the only one. So the first resurrection happens at the beginning of the millennial reign. The second resurrection is the one that Paul references in Acts chapter 24, where he, he says, I'm on trial for preaching the resurrection of the righteous and the wicked. And that's what happens at the end of the millennial reign, where all the people that live during the millennial reign, who prove themselves disciples of, of God, 
they get the promise of the covenant, which is to be resurrected and given their glorified bodies. So at that, at the, in the millennial reign, we have everyone throughout all of history that has died, both good and bad, resurrected to stand before Yeshua. The good are given the glorified bodies. They inherit the new Jerusalem. And in fact, Jubilees references that they'll inherit the entire earth at that point. Um, it'll all become the kingdom, not just specifically that the house of God as well. That that will still be there, but then the, the entirety of the earth will be uh, will be referenced as you know the kingdom at that point. It, and so, but then all the all the wicked that are resurrected at the end of the millennial reign as well, they're thrown in the lake of fire and destroyed forever. Matthew ten twenty eight, body and soul destroyed. Okay, so that's where uh, a lot of people, for some reason, you know, especially like preachers and everything, they they, they may even mention the first resurrection because they end, but because they don't understand resurrection at any level of depth, it leads to questions like you're asking, right? Because they're, but you're sitting there saying, well, you know, why, what, what happens to all these other people that are populating for a thousand years with no war, no famine, they got free health care from the, the trees of the, uh, the leaves of the trees of life, right? They got the water of life they can drink from, uh, which Isaiah 47 says goes out and replenishes the water courses of all the world. So you've got an amazing, beautiful society where there's no problems People are going to be living to the age of the tree of life, as Isaiah 65 talks about. They're living super long lives again. Um, it's a shame if a man dies at 100, right? He'll be considered a youth. So you've got a bountiful earth that's being populated like crazy with no strife, no disease, no war. What happens to all those people? Same thing, same thing that happens at the first resurrection. The first resurrection is in itself a form of judgment. You're taking the saint, you're evaluating his life, and you're judging him whether he gets resurrection to a, a glorified eternal body or not. John 3, 16, right? That we get eternal life. So um, all that's done, of course, to Yeshua. He's the judge, as we as we get explained to us in John 5. So that's that's where all the people that inhabit the, the millennial reign that are birthed during that time, that have survived the day of the Lord and start, you know, continue the rest of their lives and uh, throughout the millennial reign. And then the subsequent generations after that, well, that thousand year period, they all have to, you know, stand before Yeshua and face judgment as well. Some will be given and glorified eternal bodies and some it will be depends on their life. They may not make it right. They may be the same, same situation, except I think they're going to be percentage wise. There'll be a ton more people that do make it because they don't have Satan. They don't have the unclean spirits. Uh, they literally have all of us, the resurrected saints running around, teaching them Torah, uh, helping them with things. Um, so I think that that's just why I've always said the the people that take part in the second resurrection, the righteous, the, which have been people that have been disciples of God through the millennial reign, will be a far greater number than those who took pay, place in the first resurrection, in my opinion. And I mean far greater, like the biggest harvest ever. In fact, us right now who are in discipleship and in faith, waiting for the promise of the fulfillment of the covenant to get our eternal bodies at the first resurrection to be made into this priesthood. We are a type, this is why we're called a type of first fruits, right? Because we are um, a very small percentage of a much greater harvest that's going to happen at the end of the millennial reign. But the father needs competent people that knows how to teach his behavior to other people. That's why we're being trained up right now to be that's why it says Revelation 24 through 6, blessed is he who takes part in the first resurrection, because he'll be a priest who reigns and rules with Christ for a thousand years. So this whole concept we're in now is just building a priesthood, like we were reading about with Aaron and his sons, a very, very small group of people over a much, much larger group of people proportionally. Well, that's going to be the same way with the hundreds of millions of people that would go into this priesthood of the first resurrection. And I don't know what the, you know, comparatively, I don't know exactly how many people are going to be saved, but, but comparatively, like just to say it's, you know, out of 7 billion people or 8 billion people say, you know, hundreds of 500 million of them become a part of this Royal priesthood. Well, then the people that they're going to be ministering to as they populate outside the city of the regular mortals, that's going to grow into a much, much greater number in my opinion, because this earth, especially with the father, the father's house here, and there's no war, there's no famine, no disease, and we have, you know, help people show how to properly use the land and be husbandry over the land. I think this earth can sustain you know, literally, you know, 50 to 70 billion people easily. So Absolutely. because it's just, just massive, massive amounts of people. Um, this is why 
um, I get excited about the promise of the covenant. Oh, where'd you go, buddy? Sorry, I don't know what happened. You just went off screen. But this is why I get excited about the promise of the covenant, which is the, the first resurrection. I talk about it so much. It's a part of my new subscribers playlist. It's some of the first videos that did in this channel. Just try to help people understand that's the promise of the covenant we're in. We get to the new covenant, which is at the first resurrection event. So we can become a part of this priesthood for a thousand years so that we can then train up and disciple all the mortals who live outside the new Jerusalem so they can walk in Torah and take part in the second resurrection. And we're going to, we're going to bring in a harvest greater than anyone can ever imagine. In my opinion, the father will win the numbers game in my opinion at the end of the day. So just my, my opinion. Absolutely. I agree. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. That's, that's a beautiful picture, especially with like the beautiful city and the stones. I definitely agree that the, the harvest is going to be uh, greater with no war, you know, uh, the father on earth. Uh, yeah. Thank you for answering that. Cause like, I've been going through a lot and trying to study on this and it's like with modern day churches and, you know, they're not understanding the context. It's so confusing with the, cause they interpret the resurrections as something else. And it's like, no, they don't understand what resurrection means. They think, you know, yeah. you die and instantly go to heaven and uh, hell and all this stuff. And it's like, you know, they don't, the context. So I appreciate it and everything you're doing once more and, you know, praise the yeah, father. Man. Hallelujah. Thank you. Um, it's, yeah. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate yeah. you calling in. Um, we don't have any other callers, but uh, you're, you're welcome to stick around if you want. If you have another question, it's up to you. I'll be ending the broadcast here in about five minutes. We have a, another uh, two questions of the same nature being asked by uh, Susanna and Justina in the chat. And they're asking about what role will women play at the resurrection if, you know, and, and to answer Susanna's question, only men can be priests. Women cannot be priests, but women can be prophetesses which is very similar to a priest as, as far as someone that teaches the Torah to other people, except they just don't literally do the sacrifices. Okay. But they do have a position of leadership, whereas they can teach other women the Torah of God. Right. And this is what you would see. Uh, Miriam would be in a position of, she's called a prophetess in numbers. And then also, or I think it's an Exodus. And then also um, we see prophetesses throughout the scriptures as well. Even in the new Testament, Luke chapter two with Anna in the temple. So, a prophet or a prophetess, same concept. They would have to be responsible for teaching the people Torah and guiding them or also admonishments back to Torah, right? So will women have a role in the new millennial reign as we minister to all the survivors who then repopulate the earth? hundred percent. All those people are going to be still mortal. They're going to be still struggling with, you know, learning the behavior of God and, and resisting temptation to sin. And then when they do sin, Although they're going to need to bring forth atonement, right? To make, to make atonement through the priesthood of the kingdom, which means there's going to be a role for prophetesses and prophets, right? So you be able to go out, teach them the Torah, and admonish them into into repentance. Um, so yes, hundred percent, there'll be a role. You, but you, I don't see a place because of the description of the priesthood. I don't see a place where women specifically will be bringing forward um, the actual offerings to make the meals with Yahweh, because that's not appointed in the Torah for women, only for men. So hopefully that's a decent explanation for you, both ladies. So do, yes, you have a wonderful role, wonderful role in the kingdom as well. That, if I may ask, that brings up an interesting question, because I know the, you know, the father and, uh, you know, Yeshua, they're masculine in heaven. And I've seen you talk about that with the watchers and, you know, all that, the masculine attributes. But, um, and forgive me again if this is something that's been covered a lot, but it, the when they, you know, it says we will be as the angels, you know, in um, in heaven, and okay. there's no more marriage and all that. Um, is there still those attributes, or is uh, is that changed as well? Because I that that's that's an interesting question that was just asked, and um, the, that makes say, me think could about you, could that. You, I'm sorry, could you reword it? Are the attributes of who or what? What are you saying? So, uh, you know how you said prophetess, uh, prophetesses, and then the, you know you have the priests, and the priests would be men. When sure. uh, when the resurrection happens, and you know we get our heavenly bodies, is there still those female and male attributes? Yes. Which is why there'd be a difference. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's gonna be in. I think it's in Isaiah 61. Let me see if I can go there real quick. Uh, it talks about your sons and your daughters will be brought on the arms. Uh, and that's referring to the arms of the angels at the resurrection. Yeah, you're going to be resurrected back into your your proper biological body that you were given. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. 
So yeah, that, this is where you get into a lot of weird Gnosticism. People think you get uh, resurrected into a non um, gender based body, like some sort of, you know, bad depiction of angels with no genitals or that's not how the father describes it. Right. That's a Gnostic idea. Um, this, the father even made the angels in heaven as male. So this is why we, women are a unique creation. There weren't any women made in heaven in the beginning. They were only made on the earth for men. So the, yes, you'll be resurrected as a woman back into your resurrection body. Uh, truth seeker is asking with all detail given in the priestly garments, where are the zizis? Well, brother, the priestly garments were for a specific moment. They didn't wear those 24 seven. They didn't wear those throughout the city. They only wore them when they were going through a specific moment to make a specific meal to the father. Um, and it, it wasn't something like they wore on a regular basis for the high priesthood. We, we read specifically about the high priesthood in these chapters today. Um, so that was a, uh, a specific garb that they put on, and then they would take that off when they were done. In the garb itself, you've got white and blue mixed together. The whole thing's a big zit <laughs> The whole thing is you doing the commandments of God faithfully to the Father in at the pinnacle of obedience. It's You don't have to be reminded. You're literally walking in it in that moment, if that makes any sense. The zitzit is a reminder to do the commandments. The priesthood are literally doing the commandments actively as they're doing it. Oh, and yes, they do have the same color symbolism in their outfit. So yeah, hopefully that's a decent answer for you, brother. Uh, Sebastian Porras is asking, are the sheep in the sheep and ghost judgment people who were not exposed to Torah, but exhibited that behavior in their life? Yes. If you go check out a video I've done, it's called Just Judgment. It's the second video in my Torah Apologetics playlist. So go to my playlist here on YouTube, go to Tour Tor Apologetics, It'll be the second video that's called Just Judgment, episode two. And I, I break Matthew 25 down and I go into Romans, I go into a whole bunch of other scriptures and explain to you that this, those who are deemed sheep, if you go through verses 31 through, I think it's uh, 39, those who are deemed sheep have exhibited the Torah and actually tell you all the behaviors that Yeshua says, well, because you did these behaviors that he lists off, I call you sheep and you can come inherit the kingdom of God. I go and I show you in the Torah where all those verses are. And so he's literally telling the sheep, you've been doing Torah. And the, and the sheep are like, well, when did we ever do this to you? Like they, they didn't they didn't know who Jesus was, right? Just like there's a lot of people around the earth that'll be ignorant of God. These people are not being given resurrection bodies at this moment. They're not being given the promise of the covenant. They're not being, being brought into a priesthood. They're literally being spared from physical death of judgment. So the goats, they're handed to the angels to be killed with the sword. Their bodies will decay and die. Their souls go to Sheol to wait the second resurrection at the end of the millennial reign to where they'll stand judgment. The sheep are left alive. They're the ones, the mortals that are left alive to repopulate the earth. So he's weeding out all the rebellious at his second coming so he can start over a new kingdom with people that have showed a propensity and a disposition in their heart to keep his behavior. So this is why Yeshua tells them that conversation. Yeah, you've already been doing my behavior. You just didn't know it because they have been obeying their conscience, as Paul talks about in Romans chapter 2. Their thoughts either accusing them or defending them on the day they stand before judgment in front of Jesus. So this is the fulfillment of that concept. Is We're really, we're literally going to get to watch the conversation play out in Matthew 25, 31 through 46, between the sheep and goats judgment. So yeah, hopefully that's a, a decent answer for you, brother. All of it's based on Torah. The behavior of God, the Father and the Son, all of it's based on Torah. So that's how we're going to be judged as well. All right, guys, one last question, and I'm going to shut it off for the for the day. Um, uh, Tony is asking in 1 Peter 4, 6, it says, Messiah preached to the dead. What did he preach? The kingdom? Uh, let's go there and we'll put it on screen for everybody to look at together. First Peter 4, 6. If I can share my screen here. All right. So this is the verse that we were going off of. For this cause was the gospel preached also to them that are dead, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the spirit. So, yes, if he's going down to Sheol, which he does for the three days he's in the heart of the earth, that's where Sheol is. And he has not been given his resurrected body yet. So he's down there explaining to everyone that died since Abel the, the gospel, the kingdom, right? So this, this is where a lot of people don't realize the good news. So there's there's multiple good news is that I should say there's two main good news. That's all the word gospel means, guys. Don't let people intimidate you with the idea of the gospel being 
only about the resurrection of Christ. Christ himself, before he's resurrected, just like John the Baptist, were preaching the gospel of the kingdom. It's a, it's a word that literally just means good news. Okay. That's all, that's all it means. Very simple. So Yeshua, everywhere he went, he preached the gospel of the kingdom. That was, he mentions it 44 times in the different four gospels. He mentions his life, death, and resurrection less than a handful of times as far as him being resurrected to his priesthood. So, because that was already prophesied of him. And the main thing that he says in Luke 4, 43, is that he came to preach the gospel of the kingdom of God because that was why he was sent. That was the good news. Well, what, is that, what does that entail? What does it assume? It, it assumes that you have to do the commandments, that you have to believe in the, in the ones that the Father sent as the prophets to instruct you in the commandments, which Yeshua is a part of that, and that you have to believe that Yeshua is the Son of God who becomes your high priest to make atonement for you. Because if you're not, then you're rejecting the high priest that the Father gave you to actually make atonement for you and raise you to eternal life. So if you reject the Son, of course you've rejected the words of the Father to make atonement and resurrection for you. So this is where the, 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 the good news of Yeshua's life, death, and resurrection is 100% good news. 100%, yes. May no one mistake me ever talking about that. That is 100% good news for everyone because he fulfilled the promises of the prophets previously to come into this position of the high priest to make atonement for us. And then Revelation 3, 5, on the day of the, re of the, of the, day, of the day of the Lord, he'll call our names up before the Father and the angels and raise us to eternal life. That is a, is a role and a position only given to the Son, who's also our high priest. The good news that the Son talked about, and so does Paul, Peter, James, all the other Gospels, is the kingdom coming, as well as all the prophets of the Old Testament, even all the way back to Enoch. They always talk about the kingdom coming, the day when the king who always comes with this kingdom, comes down to the earth and judgment and justice is happening on the earth. So there's peace on the earth. So if all the people that are waiting in Sheol, the first resurrection has not happened yet, still has not happened. All the people that have died from Abel all the way to the day that Yeshua comes on the second coming, that group is in Sheol waiting the resurrection. All the righteous, I should say, right? So yes, he's going to go down there and he's going to express to them both the kingdom of God and he could also express to them, hey, by the way, guys, I'm I'm actively going through the process. I'm about to be resurrected. I'm going to become a high priest. This is what was prophesied. Father's going to follow through with his plan because the father's faithful. He's never he's never changes his plan like that. And he's going to make it happen. And, and that's going to ensure salvation for all of you down here in Sheol waiting for resurrection. So hopefully that's a decent thorough answer for you, brother. Um, we're, we, I went through a lot of different concepts at once, but that's that's the shortest I think I can put it. Justina, thank you so much for the super uh, super sticker. I really appreciate you. Um, bless you. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to close this out here. Uh, Christian, I appreciate you being with me, brother. Yeah. Yeah. Shabbat yeah thanks shalom. for calling in. Yeah. Yeah. Bless you. Uh, have a blessed Sabbath day. You too, brother. See you later. All right, guys. Thanks for being here with me um, here on tour apologetics. Hopefully it's, uh, it's edifying to you. Hopefully you learned something today. Um, we went over some big topics today. Uh, we've done a lot of individual videos on them, but today we got to talk about them all together in a, in big conversation. So hopefully it's been a blessing to you. Um, appreciate you guys. I, I just want to update you everybody that, um, uh, unfortunately I'm, I'm kind of heartbroken today. <laughs> I, I have some sad news to, to let everybody know that uh, we did a fundraiser in the past for a, um, a sweet family. Um, the mother of that family was, was battling, um, cancer. And unfortunately, uh, the father went ahead and took her, uh, she's, she's now, you know, awaiting her resurrection. And so, uh, just if you, if you did, uh, contribute to the fundraiser for her family, for her treatment, I just want to thank you so much. If you prayed for, <laughs> um, I want to thank you so much. And, uh, if, if you did reach out to that family and you, and you, um, And you uh, and you prayed for them. Um, you're welcome to send them your your love and support again, uh, if you know them. So um, I really appreciate everyone that we have an awesome awesome community of people that uh, that helped them and, and sent love of words of encouragement and love to them. So uh, that family needs your prayer. All right, you guys have a great week. We'll see you next time.